I'm Tommaso Poggio, um, the director of the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. And I have the great pleasure to introduce Amnon Shashua today. There are very few scientists worldwide who are capable of m both making theoretical scientific breakthroughs and transforming them into technological breakthroughs of importance for industry and for society. And Amnon is one of these very exceptional people. So I met Amnon first when he arrived to MIT for graduate studies, and this was uh, um, 1988, something like that. And then he joined uh, my group as a postdoc in 92, and then uh, we interacted on a number of technical issues in <coughs> computer vision and computer graphics. I also, um, I think I started his interest in the entrepreneurship, which he followed very successfully, as you'll hear today. Um, he was, of course, one of the best postdoc I ever had, and one of my greatest friends. Um, he did his, PhD, his master thesis with Shimon Ullman on saliency computation, and later uh, he worked on vision recognition, uh, recognition in vision, for his PhD thesis, obtaining a simple but powerful results on invariance to illumination that has been since rediscovered multiple times. Um, at the 94, around the, the end of his postdoctoral stage here at MIT, he wrote a paper on multiple view geometry, which introduced a fundamental uh, algebraic relationship between three views which is related to the tri trifocal tensor, which has found many theoretical and practical applications ranging from 3D reconstructions, calibrating camera, robotic navigations, computer graphic animation. In uh, 95, he founded Conitens, a company that used the trifocal tensor mathematics, combining optics, mechanics, physics of illuminations in a product for extremely accurate industrial 3D measurements. In 2000, he founded Mobileye, and in, in 2010, Orcam. They are both industrial partner of the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, and they are, in fact, Mobileye and Orcam, the ones I always speak when I speak about the center as examples of our industrial partners and their leadership in the technology of intelligence. I'm always and continuously amazed by the depth, the mathematical sophistication of Amnon's work and by his uh, enormous impact on technological applications. As you will hear in his talk, mobilize an amazing case. As I think is the prototypical success story in computer vision up to today and in machine learning, both of them. Um, precisely because the extent and the success of the underlying mixture of sophisticated theory and impressive technological applications is absolutely unique. Um, I'm very proud to introduce to you Amnon Shashua. Amnon. Wow, Tommy, what, what, what an introduction. <laughs> I have very fond years of, uh, of MIT. So it's one of my best five years of my life. But I forgot how cold it can be here in Boston. <laughs> Today I came in with a ski, ski uh, coat and still was very cold to the bones. So I'll talk about computer vision. And I think that the title here is very bold, computer vision that changes, changes our world. Uh, we all have cameras with us. All smartphones have uh, cameras. They do a bit of computer vision. When we take a picture, they'll do a face uh, detection. They can do also a, a panoramic uh, stitching, which was one of the major you know, algorithms in computer vision a, a decade ago. But you cannot state that what the cameras on smartphones do today will change our world. So wh wh why this statement is very bold? Because I'm going to talk about something else related to, to cameras. It is a time in which cameras are either on us or nearby us, 
And those cameras are doing computer vision continuously, not on demand, not when we take a picture there's some computer vision going on, but continuously. <coughs> and those two areas are cameras in cars, so the cameras are near us when we drive, and wearable cameras, cameras on us. And, and those are the stories of Mobileye, where it's cameras in the car, and Orca, where cameras are, are on us. So I'll start with, uh, with Mobileye. What we do there is a camera front-facing, looking at the scene, understanding the visual world, understanding where vehicles are, where pedestrians are, where traffic signs are, where lanes are, traffic lights, trying to get a detailed understanding of the visual field and use that in order to prevent uh, accidents. So let me show you. This is a clip. It's part of the Super Bowl uh, commercial by uh, Hyundai. And first I'll show you the clip, and then I'll explain why I'm showing this clip. Need it, I can count on you like four, three, two. Remember when only Dad could save the day? Sorry. Auto emergency braking on the all-new Genesis. From Hyundai. Okay, so what you saw here is the system. This is a um, mobilized system. Camera on the windscreen detecting that there, there's an imminent uh, collision, uh, warning before a collision, and applying the brakes before a collision. Now, wh why is this commercial important? Because a Super Bowl commercial is very, very expensive. Every second of air costs a lot of money. Now, Hyundai here is uh, showcasing their new vehicle, Genesis. Now, when you're showcasing a new vehicle, there's lots of stuff you can talk about. You can talk about the engine, you can talk about the multimedia. There are many things to talk about. And, and they chose to talk about active safety, which means that active safety in vehicles has reached, has passed a threshold in which there is awareness by the, by the public and by the regulators such that if you have such a uh, function, you are proud of having such a function and you are even willing to spend commercial money in a Super Bowl to talk about it. This is why it is, uh, why it is important. Um, when you look at the camera looking facing uh, forward and trying to understand the visual field, there are many applications that are being done. Part of them are safety features like detecting lanes, detecting people, detecting cars, um, calculating the, the, the chance of a collision and taking actuation, whether it's warning or braking before a, a collision. Uh, recognizing uh, traffic signs, uh, uh, controlling the headlights at, at night, and then all sorts of functions that are leading us to automated uh, driving. So I'll try to kind of give more details about what, what's going on here through clips and, and simple explanations so that we can get kind of the weight of where computer vision is going to when, when we're talking about uh, uh, cars and automated driving. The clip I'm showing here is uh, a Volvo in 2010 introduced the first pedestrian detection system. It's a camera look, facing forward, detecting pedestrians, and if a collision is about to happen with a pedestrian, the car breaks. Okay. Now, they had about 5,000 journalistic events showing, showcasing uh, the car. They would, put a, uh, they would put people in the driver's seat and drive towards a mannequin, and at the last moment, the car would, the car would stop. But once the car is out there, you can buy it. People do their own testing. So this is a clip I downloaded from the internet. This is a bunch of Polish guys. And it, it's a bit funny, but it actually shows you what the system does. So. To je dobré, počkaj, čiže... Keď ste chodec, tak musíte zastať niekde tu a nehýbať sa. And this works up to 70 km per hour, so it's not only in, in slow speed. Yes. You're Slovak, yeah. <laughs> A Slovak? Okay, I'll change it. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, these, uh, these kinds of functions it is proven that they save lives. This is a report by the Institute of uh, Insurance in the US. And you see here that there are statistically significant numbers, minus 40% chance of bodily injury liability, all in a system that simply only warn you against a, a collision. Imagine a system that breaks before a collision. Now, because it is low cost, 
low cost because it's only a camera. Camera costs about five dollars. Then you need a microprocessor to process information, but every sensor needs a microprocessor to process information. So we're talking about a very, very low cost sensor with, uh, with a proven uh, ability to save lives. It, it involves now the regulators. Government regulation influences the car industry to introduce these systems that are called active safety, introduce active safety as a standard fit, just like airbags, just like uh, stability uh, control. And what this brings us in is two trends in this industry. One is an evolutionary trend where these safety regulations influence the car industry to put these systems as a standard fit. Standard fit meaning the driver doesn't pay for the system. You get it just like you get it with airbags. So by 2017, 18, every new car on the road in developed countries, every new car on, on the road has as a standard fit an active safety system. So we're talking about tens of millions of cars every year with these kinds of uh, capability. Then the second trend, we call this a, re a revolutional trend, which has the potential of transforming the way we drive is autonomous driving uh, capability, where you can let go of the steering, let go of the throttle and, and brakes, and the car will drive on its own, at first in limited situations like highway driving, and then going into rural and, and city, city traffic, and then eventually take out the driver completely from, from the driving experience. So this is an example of uh, Nissan Qashqai. So 2014 has five star ratings, uh, Euro NCAP uh, five star ratings. Now in order to get these uh, five stars, you can see here in the next page, the car needs to undergo certain tests, and these are collision avoidance tests. So this shows that, you know, starting, it already started in 2011, but 2014 what was, was the big change, is that if you want to get your four and five stars, you have to have these kinds of systems. So again, by 2017, 18, every car would have these kinds of uh, technologies. Uh, this is uh, in the US, same thing is being planned uh, for the uh, government regulations in, in the US. It's called CIB, Collision Imminent Braking. By 2016, all new cars that they want their five stars will have to comply with these, with these functions. We see this also with um, the, uh, the effect of regulatory involvement in, in the sales of, of uh, Mobili. So Mobili produces a chip. It is a system on chip and with algorithms to, to do this visual interpretation, to do the computer, computer vision. So we started launching 2007. So the five years between 2007 and 2012, we shipped one million chips, so one million cars with this kind of technology. 2013 alone was 1.3, and 2015, 14, it's more than double. So you see this kind of exponential uh, rise. You can see this also with the number of car models. 2010, there were 36 car models with this technology, over seven car manufacturers. 2016, we're talking about 240 over 23 car manufacturers. So there's this kind of exponential growth because one, it's a technology that saves lives. Second, it's very low cost. You have to have both of them in order to, to have an impact. If you have something expensive, even if it saves lives, it cannot enter. If you have something low cost but doesn't do anything useful, also doesn't enter. You have to have both of them. And the next, uh, the next stage is automated driving. I'll show you a clip that we uh, prepared for our uh, roadshow half a year ago. It shows me driving and talking to me not driving and talking to the, to the camera. What I'm saying is not important. I just want you to see what I'm, so I'll. With automated driving. Okay, so don't need to hear me. <laughs> uh, the fact here is that you, you can see that I'm, I'm, for extended period of time, I'm not even looking at, at the road. It is, this is my personal car, by the way. Uh, it's a completely autonomous. Uh, I can drive, say, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I don't touch the steering wheel even, even once. It is very, very robust. And it's going to, be, uh, going to be launched. This kind of technology is going to be launched as early as three months from now. Tesla already announced that three months from now you can have hands-free driving. It's going to be a bit limited to what my car can do, but that's only the start. By 2016, there's going to be new launches by GM and, uh, and Tesla as well. 2017 and 2018 uh, additional launches. Uh, Volvo is, is, is one of them. Three more car manufacturers that I cannot mention their names also in 2017-18. So it, it, it is... There's a driving force uh, behind it. 
So let, let's start looking under the hood. Okay, so I made some advertisement, why it is interesting. Now let's see what's happening here under, under the hood. When we look in, ter in terms of the computer vision, these are the main, main issues that need to be resolved. One is object detection. So object detection means detect vehicles, front, rear, side of the vehicle. Detect pedestrians, also various poses of pedestrians. We need to know whether the pedestrian is looking at us. The pedestrian, we see the back of the pedestrian. Is the pedestrian on the road? Is the pedestrian on the sidewalk? Uh, detect animals. Volvo is, I think, in the next two weeks, launching a system that does also animal detection. So a horse, a moose, big, big animals. There are many accidents with, with, with animals, by the way. Uh, traffic signs. We're talking about, about a vocabulary of about 1,000 traffic signs that the system can, can recognize. Traffic lights and the stop line of traffic lights, road markings. So all of this is object detection. Then you have visual motion analysis. Ego motion, understanding the rotation and translation of our movement, of the car movement. A structure for motion, creating 3D from optic flow. Collision assessment, if we see something moving and we are moving, are we going to collide or not going to, uh, going to collide? A lot of visual motion analysis behind this. Uh, general object detection, are we going to hit something? We don't know what we're going to hit, but we're going to hit something. Could be a trash can or it's called general objects. This also uses a lot of visual motion analysis. Then we have road analysis, detect lanes if we can find them. A road geometry, kind of to build planar surfaces on, on, on the road. Path planning, to know where if you want now to drive autonomously, where, is, where, should, where, the, where the car should be in the next uh, second or so. Um, if there are lanes, it's simple, but if there are not lanes, one needs to, to do something there. Uh, road profile, detect bumps and potholes. This is, this is an important thing. It's both a comfort function and also a safety function when you do autonomous driving. As a comfort function, if you have the ability to control your shock absorbers, you can pass smoothly over bumps, which kind of defies the purpose of having the bumps from, to begin with. Um, <laughs> but this is, uh, this is going to be introduced 2016 by, by one of our customers. But if you have the ability to detect bumps, you also have the ability to detect debris, hazards. Let's assume somebody threw a tire on the road. So it's a 10 centimeter object, say 50 meters away. You want to be able to detect it in order to at least warn the driver that you're going to hit, you're going to go over a debris. So that's road analysis. Environmental modeling. Ultimately, it's give me for every pixel in the image a label, what it is. Is it coming from a barrier, coming from a curb, coming from a guardrail? Is it coming from a vehicle, a side of a vehicle, front of a vehicle? Is it coming from a pedestrian? Is it coming from a pole? Anything. Every pixel in the scene, tell me what it is. In order to create a complete picture of, of the environment, say 180 degrees, create a complete picture of the environment in order to path plan the car in an autonomous driving uh, situation. This is really science fiction when you think about what computer vision can can do. So I'll show you examples of, of all of these. Um, this clip kind of tries to put many of these things uh, together. So I'll, I'll run this clip and maybe stop it after a few frames. Okay, let's stop it here. So what we see here. So we see bounding boxes the, on, on pedestrians, cyclists and pedestrians. We see bounding boxes on vehicles. We see this green carpet, which tells me where the free space is. This is a traffic sign. This is a traffic light. Okay. And of course, the pedestrians can be detected also when they are occluded and, and all sorts of things. Let me stop this again. You can see here again, this green carpet you know, goes around all the places which are road, not curbed, not barriers, not vehicles, not pedestrians, in order to allow the system to path plan. Okay, so let me show you something. This is exemp an example of animal detection. This is going to be on Volvos, right? So you have a big animal, it's being detected, and if there's going to be a collision, the collision will be, will be avoided. Uh, traffic lights. You see here, we have here a complex scene, like a city traffic, so whenever there's a traffic light being detected uh, together with the color of the traffic light, a system detects the traffic lights, detects the relevancy of the traffic lights, which traffic light is for straight, for left, for right, and also detects the stop line to know where, where to stop. And it's going to be launched in a few months uh, by one of the car manufacturers. Uh, pavement markings, what you see here, detection of pavement markings, arrows and so forth, this is important for autonomous uh, driving. I'll skip this. 
um, pedestrian detection but with understanding the pose. So for example, what's written here is on road. These are pedestrians are on road, on pavement. You know that these pedestrians are on pavement. Uh, later we'll see pedestrians with their pose. For example, it's written here, that's the back and front of the, of the pedestrian. Okay, so a better understanding of what pedestrians are, are doing, not only that there is a pedestrian and this is the range of the pedestrian, this is the angle to the pedestrian, but what the pedestrian is doing is also part of, uh, of the activity. Um, this is the detection of bumps. So what, what we're going to see here is that there is a four centimeter bump here. Okay, and you see here, this is the profile of the vision system. So the vision system detected that there is a bump and gives also the height of, of the bump. And now if you have uh, automatic electronic shock absorbers, you can pass through the bump without, without even feeling it. But this kind of technology, you can use it also for debris detection. In the next uh, clip, what you see here, there's going to be a 10 centimeter height object. And these blue points are magnified here. This is a zoom of this area. And the blue points will turn into red when the system detects an object with this ten, which is 10 centimeters height and, and above. Let me run this slowly. slowly. So you can see how these points turned into, into red. The next one is just a plastic bag on the road, so there's no, no points turning into red. And this one here is another real object. And you see how the points. So this is the ability to, to detect debris. And this is using visual motion understanding, plane plus parallax. Whoever here is, has a, a education in computer vision, this is plane plus uh, parallax. Next thing is uh, path planning. So with path planning, we want to be able to tell what is the, where's the path that the, that the car needs to go. Imagine hands-free driving, the car needs to decide the path. So now, in many cases, you have lanes. If you find lanes, then the problem is simple. You simply you know, do a polynomial approximation to the shape of, of the road, and you can follow this polynomial approximation. But imagine that there are no lanes. So I'll, sh I'll show you several examples where you see, you look at the clip, you don't see lanes yet a human driver can easily determine uh, the path. And what we're doing here, we use uh, holistic information. We're, we're using context. So it's not only a bottom-up process which tries to find lanes, because that process will fail, that, that there are no lanes. It uses all the, Im all the information that there is in the image. For example, there could be guardrails, barriers, other cues that people extract from the image when, when they look at such, at such an image. And we use a, a deep network in order to go from input to, to output. We have lots of deep networks in, in, in the system. I'll show two of them. This is one of them. So let's have a look at this. So you see here that you know, even though there's no, there's no lanes, this green line is the path ahead. The system correctly determines uh, the path uh, forward, even though there are no lanes in, in, in the image. Let's look at this one here. This is city traffic. You'd like to have support hands-free driving also in city traffic, but there are no lanes in city traffic. If you look at this clip, simply no lanes yet you want to be able to understand that there are two, two lanes here and, and this is the path uh, to follow, even in, in city traffic. Because there's lots of holistic information that allows you, for example, the curbs here, that allows you to figure out where, what's, what's the path uh, to drive, even though there, there, there are no lanes. Next one is being able to determine the free space. So free space is where I'm allowed to drive, and on the edges of this free space, tell me what it is. Is it an edge with the side of a car? Is this an edge with a curb? Is this an edge with a guardrail? Is this an edge with a pole? And, and, and so forth, in order to build a complete environmental model. So what I'm showing here is this green carpet is the free space. And then on the edge of the free space, there are three codes. One is the car, which is the blue. The red is the physical edge which could be a curb or a guardrail. And this uh, purple is the side of a car. Let me run this so you can have an, an appreciation of what this does. And this is, this is based on, on single image uh, understanding. I mean, there, there's no need for, for motion analysis here. Okay, so this is a deep network that, that combines a convolutional net with graphical models all put uh, together, running at uh, 30 frames uh, per second on a single, on a single uh, chip. 
and taking only 5% of the chip capacity. So this is uh, very, very uh, efficiently. Here is another uh, example, just showing the green carpet without the uh, information on the edges. So for example, it knows that this is a barrier, right? And it knows that this is also a barrier because it, see, it stops at, at the curb and also this car is, is, is a barrier and also the information here. All of this is learned through an input-output uh, uh, machine, a learning machine using a convolutional net in this case. Here's another example. All right, so you see this green carpet here it stops because there's a curb and here it goes, it goes inside and there's going to be now a person walking with a stroller and you see that the green carpet doesn't go over the person. Okay. So altogether, all you can think of it as that you have an input, the image, you have flow. If we have more than one camera, there's also depth. There's some uh, coupling constraints for a graphical model. Then there's a deep network going on with many outputs. One is the pixel labeling, the other one is the path planning, and then the objects, vehicles, traffic signs, pavement markings, and, and so forth. So it's, it's a huge uh, monster of a, learning, of a learning machine going on there. All of this is running on a, on micro, on, on a specially designed uh, microprocessor. This is the current generation called IQ, IQ3. It was launched October last year. First uh, vehicle platform that was launched on was the Tesla. And a few weeks ago it was uh, on Audi. And during this year there are going to be another nine launches with eight different car manufacturers of the IQ, IQ3. In terms of uh, the design of this architecture, it's a combination of CPUs. So it has eight cores, four CPUs for you know, general branch and bound code and special vector accelerators that are dedicated to computer vision. They're more, they more efficient than uh, GPUs and, and DSPs for, uh, for computer vision. So it's not a general purpose chip. It will not be a chip used for coding, decoding uh, image. It will not be used for a laptop. It would be used for only, for only for computer vision. This one has, each of these cores has 64 multiply accumulate per cycle, running at uh, half a gigahertz. So if you multiply all of this together, this is uh, a one quarter teraflop of uh, processing power, but with a very high utilization. The utilization for a uh, convolutional net is around 0 0.9, which is three times more than what you get with a GPU, for example. This is the next uh, generation chip coming out uh, this year, the uh, fourth quarter. And this has multiple different vector accelerators. This one is the same as these vector accelerators, but there are two additional one that cover the spectrum of flexibility and power, the complete spectrum of flexibility and power, so that you can reach a utilization close to 1.0 on all computer vision algorithms. And if you just calculate the raw power, it's more than 2.5 teraflops of, uh, of computing power without counting the, the, the CPUs. So this is very, very powerful. A chip like this is designed to start being launched 2018. Uh, with can connect eight cameras and doing computer vision simultaneously with, with eight cameras, three cameras in the front. Uh, the reason why you need three cameras in the front for automated driving, because you want very wide field of view, just like a human driver sees about 180 degrees. But if you have only one camera with a fish eye, then you don't have range. So you need more than one camera. So one is a fish eye, another one is a medium range, another one is a narrow field of view, such that together you can see up to 300 meters and also 180 degrees, so three cameras on front and then four cameras surround, another narrow rear camera, so altogether you have eight cameras and together also with radars and leaders all feeding in into one, into one chip. Okay, and the way this uh, autonomous uh, driving is moving forward is this year, three months from now, you're going to have capability, highway capability of autonomous uh, driving where these systems can, you know, you're on a highway, you simply let go of the steering wheel, it will maintain its path and also change lanes whenever necessary, but only in a highway setting. And then within 2017, 18, these systems will move into rural and, and city driving, but under the assumption that the driver is behind the steering wheel, and the driver has a grace period somewhere between 10 to 20 seconds when the system thinks that the driver needs to take back control, there's still 20 seconds time to wake up the driver 
and have them take, uh, take control. Okay, so it, it's really around the corner. We're talking about starting now till 2018, you can have a, a system which can do 90% 90, 90 of the driving uh, experience. Okay, so this was, was Mobileye. And, and when you think about this kind of, this level of computer vision, it is really the incarnation of artificial intelligence. If we thought that you know, the first incarnation of artificial intelligence will be on robots, on human type, humanoid type of robots, Asimov type of uh, robots, we know today that you know, this artificial intelligence, the first incarnation is really cars. Every car with these kinds of systems has the ability to interpret images at a very, very high level. Some of these functionalities even exceed human level uh, recognition. The ability to detect pedestrians here is better than, than humans. Um, no, we know that because we, we, we test it, we validate it, we compare it to, we take all the errors of these systems, show them to humans, they cannot do better. Um, and as we go forward to really support uh, complete autonomous driving, you're talking about superhuman uh, capabilities. And, and again, this is around the corner. We're not talking about uh, science fiction. So this is why this kind of technology changes our world. Why it changes our world? Because imagine the driverless car in terms of a, a potential transformative way of the way we drive. So if you have cars that are accident-free, then perhaps you don't need all these passive safety that takes a lot of weight in, in the car. You can, you can simplify the, the manufacturing and, and the design of a car. It could also change completely the way we own cars. Right, you can have an Uber type of uh, application in which a driverless comes, a car comes to where you are, takes you to where you want to go, and there could be many, many of these cars, so you don't need even to own a car. And again, we're talking about things that are not science fiction. Somewhere between now and 10 years from now, these kinds of things will be around us. So, and, and computer vision is, is the primary source of all of this. Why is the primary source? There are radars, there are lidars. But all of these things are, that are useful, but they cannot cover the spectrum of what a camera can do. A radar is good at certain things, is very bad at other things. A, a laser scanner is good at some things, very bad at other things. A camera can be good at everything. Just like we humans with our eyes, we, we, can, we can negotiate the visual world. And what is unique about the camera is that it is very, very low cost. It's a few dollars. So if we have a car with many cameras around, the cost would still be very, very low. Right? In order for, for these kinds of technologies to be on every car, they cannot cost more than a few hundreds of dollars. They cannot cost $10,000. They'll never be mass produced. If they cost a few hundreds of dollars, then they'll be on every car. Th therefore, it has to be based on, on cameras. First of all, the camera can do it. Second, it's the cost is a facilitator, it's an enabler to have this on, on, on every car. So this is why it is changing our world. Let me now change gear and go to the second, uh, second area where computer vision has the potential to, potential to change our world, and this is cameras on us. So now imagine we carry a camera. The camera has human level ability to, to, understand the visual, to understand the visual field. What can we do with it? Okay, so I, I don't need a camera to interpret the visual field, and I guess you, you as well. So let's, let's take it in steps. The first step would be let's, let's, let's find a niche of society that if they had a camera on them and the camera had human level capabilities of understanding the visual field, it would be useful for them. So the first people that come in mind are the blind. The problem with blind is that it's a very, very small niche. For example, in the US, there are about one and a half million blind people. And their uh, requirements are very, very complex. They need also not to hit objects, not only understand what the visual field is, or not also prevent uh, uh, collisions with objects. Uh, it's very, very complex. But then there's another niche, which is much bigger, more than an order of magnitude bigger, and these are the visually impaired. So in the US, there's about 25 million visually impaired. So now we're talking about a significant niche of people. And these are, these are part of the society in which corrective lenses cannot correct their disability. It could be macular degeneration, it could be age-related, uh, all sorts of things that, that, that limit their ability to handle the visual, the visual world. They cannot read anymore, uh, they cannot negotiate uh, in, in, in the outdoors, uh, daily activities. And, and this segment of society doesn't have real technology to help them. People with hearing disability have good technology to help them. 
know, you can amplify certain frequencies and, and all of a sudden hear. But with, if you are visually impaired, there's nothing you can do. So if you had a camera on you and the camera had, a, say, a, an earpiece talking to you, and the camera would be intelligent enough to understand what kind of information you are looking from the scene and tell you about that. And the camera would be intelligent enough to know when you are looking for information, because you don't want to be camera talking to you all the time when you don't need to be talked at. Then it could be very, very useful. So now let's try to imagine these things. Let's assume that you are standing in a bus stop and the bus is coming. You are visually impaired. You know that the bus is coming. You see a silhouette, you hear, but you don't know what the bus number is. So now let's, let's say that the, the way we interact with the system is we point because the camera can see our finger. So we point. So the camera now knows that you want information. The camera has object recognition capability, detects a bus. It knows that if it detects a bus, the information that you want to know about, it's not that it has detected the bus. You know that there is a bus there. It was, what is the bus number? So it will read you the bus number. Let's assume you want to cross the street and you know that there's traffic light there. Uh, but you don't know what the color of the traffic light is, whether it's red or green. So you'll point again. The camera does object recognition, sees a traffic light, knows that in the context of seeing a traffic light, the information you want to know, what is the color of the traffic light? Let's say you, see, you hold a $100 bill or say $10 bill. Right? You point at it. The system has object recognition capability, understands that you're looking at the money note, and will tell you it's a $10 bill. Let's assume you are opening a newspaper. The camera knows it's a newspaper. Uh, you are pointing someplace on the newspaper. So the camera will now do a layout and read to you the closest article to your, to your, to your finger. Let's assume you are pointing at a familiar product. The camera has object recognition and also instance-based recognition capabilities. It will tell you what's the name of, of the product. Let's assume that you are looking at a familiar face. Then you don't need to point at the face. It will do this automatically. Whenever this face is in the field of view, it will tell you the name of the person. Uh, how do you teach it a new face? You simply look at the person, you point to him, finger and the face detection initiates a learning phase and the system will ask you what's the name of the person. You'll say the name of the person. Next time the person appears, it will tell you who it is. So you can now extrapolate more and more and more what a camera can do to someone who is visually uh, impaired. And this is what we have been uh, building. And this is... Um, this is how it looks like. It's a camera. It's a clip-on camera, so it clips onto existing eyeglasses. And this is a computing device. There is a cable. The computing device is the size of a smartphone. It sits in, in your pocket. And the way you interact with the system is with finger pointing. Um, and uh, what I said, it, it uh, can learn both faces and, and uh, objects. It will read, read also text in the wild. If there is a uh, street sign name, I point on it, it will tell me what, what what's written there, uh, recognize places, faces, and, and objects, and there are many more things that are in the roadmap that something like this ca can do. So let me, one moment. So let me show you a clip that first describes this. So this is a clip by Liat. She's visually impaired from birth, and she works at Orca. Okay, so this is an advertisement, but then later I'll show you clips from real, uh, from real users, but this is to give you a, an idea. Hi, I'm Liat, and I'm visually impaired. I want to show you today how this device changed my life. Great, let's go there. Red light. Green light. Fifty shackle. Fifty shackle. Let's buy some coffee. Breakfast. Bagel plus coffee with cream cheese, croissant, yogurt, cream with fresh fruit. The Fresh Paint Contemporary Art Fair began six years ago. Okay, I'll skip this. This is the way you teach. Uh, Start object learning mode. Okay, I'll skip this. So we started 2010. For three years, we developed the capability hardware and, and software. And June 2013, yeah, June 2013, 
we had John Markov from the New York Times. Uh, he's a, a science reporter from the New York Times. He came for a visit and, and he wrote a very nice article about Orkan. So we decided that at the time when the article appears, we'll launch the website of the company. Until that point, we didn't have any website. We were working in stealth mode. And that would be an opportunity to build a user base, a real user base, not people that we pay money to to the test our device, but real, but real customers. And when we launched the, the website, we wrote the price of a device is $2,500. And we said the first 100 people that will buy the device will get it by September. That was June. So within an hour, those 100 people, it was sold out. And then we, we kept on a waiting list. We have more than 25,000 people on the waiting list right now. So those 100 people did not get the device in September. You know. <laughs> they got it around January. And throughout 2014, we're working with them in order to get feedback, improve uh, the device, better understand how real visually impaired people interact with, su with such a device. One of the things that we, uh, we learned that this is not a device you can send over mail with an instructional video. Uh, you need to have a hands-on uh, training to, to, uh, to show how the device works, how you point, and, and so forth. Uh, second thing that we learned, which was uh, kind of uh, surprising to me, was the fact that you know, with Mobileye, the technology must be perfect. You, know, you cannot have a false braking. You, know, you are driving leisurely and all of a sudden your car thinks that there's a pedestrian in front, there's nothing there in front, and it all, all of a sudden applies the brakes. That's a, a catastrophe. It has to work perfectly. But I thought that in the context of Orcam, since these people don't have an alternative, so if the system so, you know, sometimes doesn't work well, it's OK. It turns out that I was wrong people find ways to compensate for their disabilities. So for example, if you, you are reading, they take the text and put them one or two centimeters before their eyes and they read letter by letter. Sounds awkward, but you, know, you, you get used to it after a while. So that they have ways to, to compensate for, the, for their disabilities. They will change their way. They'll move to a new technology only if this new technology works consistently, always. If it sometimes works, sometimes it does not work, they'll revert back to their old habits. So, so we learned that during 2014, for example, there were issues with low light that we had to improve, also replace the, the camera to a more sensitive camera. And yeah. this process ended around uh, two weeks ago. We are now upgrading and adding 50 more new users, then we'll add another 50, and by summer this year, we are going to uh, launch uh, launch this device. So let me show you some examples from real uh, users. So I'll show you three examples. And, and these are really illuminating examples. The first example is Marcia. She's from, from Brazil. So we, the 100 users are only American, only US. The system only uh, speaks and reads English. Later, we'll add more languages. But at the moment, it's only, only English. Um, Marcia, she's from Brazil, so she didn't uh, agree to accept an, a no answer. So she took a plane and came to, came to Orcam. So we were so impressed. So we said it's not 100, it's O of 100, kind of 100-ish. And we added her. So while she's being trained, you know, somebody took an uh, iPhone and, uh, and uh, took a video. What's interesting about this clip, a two-minute clip, first is the body language. Now, Brazilian, you can see a lot from the, from, from the body language, what the system does to her. Second, she also explains how she copes with her visual impairment, especially how, how, how she distinguishes between different money notes. So let me run this. The system is reading a newspaper. That's not important. Fantastic. <laughs>
Show the next clip. Next clip is Debbie. You get one of the 100. She appeared in APAC uh, last year uh, in front of 14,000 uh, delegates, and she gave a 14-minute show. That was the host, uh, and she would she explained how the system works. She demonstrated it and so forth. I'm not going to show you these all 14 minutes, but the last minute, uh, the host asks her about the impact of such a device, and and she answers quite. Uh, quite nicely, let, let me show you. For an example, um, I was invited to a restaurant by a friend. And usually, when we sit down, we would be presented with the menu. Uh, the, my friend would then read the menu, place her order, and then she would read the menu to me. But Brian, this time was very different. I had Orcam with me. And I was able to read the menu myself. I was able to place my order. I was able to, it was just so fascinating. I was able to continue my conversation with my friend without my friend being focused on my disability. For the first time since losing my sight, I was able to feel like a normal person. Mm. The last one is following. It, we, had, we had, over the year, many requests by research teams to use the device as part of their research with visually impaired. And we resisted it because we knew the device wasn't, wasn't mature enough. But two months ago, we, we started releasing to one of these research groups. So this is a, an abstract of a paper that, that they wrote. What they did, they took nine devices, gave them to nine visually impaired, and they let them use it for a month. And after a month, they would interview them in order to understand the change in quality of life. And eight out of nine reported a significant change in quality of life. And then they sent us the interviews. So the next interview is interesting because during the interview, the interviewer asks uh, the user, tells her that it costs a lot of money, the device. It's one thing to say, oh, it's a great device when, when you get it for free. But if you need to pay money, then OK, it's not that great. So it told her it's going to cost a lot of money. He told her $2,000, it's going to cost more, but never mind, See, even $2,000 is expensive. And her answer is, is, is very, very illuminating. So let me show this. The first few days I had the ORCAM, I was in total awe of it because for the first time I was able to open mail and mm -hmm. read it instead of having my husband read my mail. And I was able to go to a restaurant and actually read the menu and order myself with the waitress and that was exciting. When you can't do something for such a long period of time, the ORCAM was incredible. Beef is what the estimate is. Do you think such a high price would be something people would be willing to pay for a device like this? Do you think it's marginally worth it right now? Um, I think you're going to find that that's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. You know, people who have money, there's certainly no problem with $2,000. I don't have money. I am low income. But I would save my money, scrape it together in order to get it at $2,000. Okay. So it means that we are on, on the right uh, track. So where is this, where is this going? There are there is a very interesting roadmap that one can apply incrementally in order to make the system understand bit more and more details about the visual field. One is to do language uh, understanding. So once text is presented to the camera, within a fraction of a second, read all the text, which is done today, and then do uh, a text analysis. For example, look for certain keywords. For example, if you see a keyword amount due, you know you're looking at the bill, say electricity bill or telephone bill. So if the user doesn't point on anything significant, just tell him this is the bill and this is the amount uh, due. Understanding, um, for example, that it is a menu because many of the words are food related. So you know that it is a menu. So when the person points, 
the, the, the system not only read the line, but look for the number that comes later, which is the price of, of the food item. So have better text understanding, not only OCR level, but understanding the type of text. Uh, chat mode. Chat mode is, assume you are, you are out there, you are outdoor, you are you're lost orientation completely. You want the system, tell me what I see. Every frame, every second, tell me what I see. I see a tree, I see a chair, I see people. Tell me what I see. So for example, if you have a few thousands of categories, imagine kind of an image net. Th those are in computer vi vision. Imagine a type of image net or, or image annotation where given an image, tell me a story about that image. This is something that is at the cutting edge of research uh, today. This is something that can be done and will be done starting this uh, summer with this type of, of, uh, of device. So gradually allow very, very high level and sophisticated computer vision to cater a certain niche of people. And as I said, this is quite a large niche. In the US alone, it's 25 million people. Where this is going further than that, I believe that everyone will have such a device. But what's the value of such a device for people with normal sight? So we're not talking about a device which sits on eyeglasses. First, 50% of the population don't wear eyeglasses. And the other 50% that do wear eyeglasses, I guess they wouldn't like to, to look weird with a camera on the eyeglasses. So it's supposed to be some, someplace concealed. Imagine a button camera, something of this size here, which does continuous computer vision and gradually provides you value by sending critical information to your smartphone and from your smartphone to your website about people that you have met, places that you have uh, been, uh, how much time you are watching TV during uh, the day, how much time you're spending in your office, how much time, uh, who are the people that you have seen during the day, and so forth. Build your, your, your day in a very uh, detailed uh, manner for life logging purposes uh, and then other applications that you can put on top of it. And this is a device that we're building now. We already finished all the hardware phases and uh, well, now starting in the software phases. I believe somewhere between a year from now, we'll be able to launch something like this for the normal sighted people. So we're talking about here wearable computing, but really wearable computing, not a smartwatch which only shows you text messages and emails. And we're talking about something that does serious computing, continuous computer vision all the time throughout the day. We need to charge it only once a day, which is a challenge. People don't charge too many devices. Uh, but again, if, it's, if it provides significant value, you'd be willing to charge a device uh, every day. And this is where I think wearable devices are going, are going about sensors that are sophisticated enough to understand the visual world at the level that we understand them and be a companion to us. Collect the information that we missed. Well, we have eyes, but we're not attentive all the time. Collect information that, that we miss and provide that information when we need it because it's always, always there. And again, this is not science fiction. This, I believe, will be launched in a year from now and, and will have a gradual and incremental growth of continuous uh, capability of computer vision related uh, capability. So this is where I feel the future of wearable computing uh, lies. Sophisticated sensors that are on us that do real computing, not just you know, displaying uh, text messages. That's it. I think an hour passed. Questions? Danny. Um, if the system is based on kind of uh, uh, training sets and something which is uh, standard, so how d how will, will it uh, perform uh, where and there, there are exceptions uh, introduced? So in other words, how, how much similar do you think the system thinks 
like a cognitive brain. OK, I'll, I'll rephrase your question. Because you know, th th these exceptions, or let's assume they're looking at pattern recognition, and you have trained the system on, on a library of pictures of cars, and all of a sudden there is a weird looking car. Would you, would you miss it or not? The answer is not, you will not miss it. Th these learning algorithms generalize very, very well. Um, I'm telling you, with pedestrians and also with vehicles, we, we have surpassed human level capabilities. But your question is relevant in another area. In decision making, that could be, um, that could be problematic. Say, for example, you have the ability to, uh, to turn away from a collision using the steering wheel to turn away. T today, the, these systems, they only brake. But if you, have, if you have control of the steering wheel, you can decide that you can escape the, the collision rather than braking. Or, or you know that if you brake, you'll still hit the target. But if you steer away, you can. But if you steer away, there's a, now a child there. So now you have uh, a decision. I'm going to hit a car or I'm going to hit a child. Which one, is more, which one is, 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 is more important? And this is one of those things that you don't want software to decide for you. Um, and this is an issue that no one yet has an answer to. I believe that in the end it will be resolved. My, my, uh, my forecast for something like this is the way to resolve it is that you tie your hands. Even though you can steer away from an accident, a robotic system will not steer away from a, an accident. It will only break, like today's uh, system. So then you, you don't have this conundrum. You only break, you avoid the imminent collision, and even if you cannot avoid it, the only thing that you do, you, you, you can break. So there are lots of ethical issues around autonomous vehicles that are yet unsolved. But the belief of the industry is that, that you start introducing the technologies and then all the issues would get resolved on their own. But first tr start introducing the technologies. Again? Yeah. Image to story. Yeah. Yes. How do, you, how, how do you see those? Okay, first, there are a number of, of very nice uh, academic papers on this area from, uh, you know, from Stanford, from Feifei, from, from Google uh, Research, uh, from you know, Dior Wolf uh, from Tel Aviv University, that they, they train both an ImageNet and, and the language uh, model, and they combine the two through a recurrent uh, network such that when you get an image, you match it to uh, a number of uh, keywords, which will not tell you only what are the objects, but it's kind of a narrative around it. And you use a, a one you know, combined uh, deep network to go from images to, to stories. So it has been done, yet that academic uh, research. And uh, this is something that uh, is in the works also on the Orcam uh, device. I have a two-part question. The first is about liability. Uh, seems like even though accidents may be less frequent or about the same, they're going to happen maybe in a case where a person could have avoided it, as opposed to a case where a person was. I don't know. In some cases, who's going to have to take the liability for that? Is that a, I'm sure that's an issue? Second question, uh, kind of unrelated follow-up on this other one. When there's you know a policeman waving people to go through the red light and go around this way, or you make eye contact, the driver makes eye contact with someone saying, you know, wait. I assume that kind of thing is very difficult for a, for your system to, to handle. Okay, so let's talk first about uh, liability. So today, with the systems that avoid collisions, there isn't much of an issue of, of liability. Uh, because the driver is in the loop, the driver is supposed to take responsibility of a collision. The system is only helping in taking responsibility for, for a collision. So there isn't an issue of, of liability. Of course, if you have a bug in the system and there is a recall, then there is an issue of, of, of liability. When you're talking about autonomous driving, then it is a, a, real, a real issue because you are not in the driving loop. And let's assume that an accident happened and you can prove even though statistically a robotic system drives better than a human, you can prove for this particular accident, if a human was in the loop, the human would have avoided the accident. So I'm not sure that all of you are aware, but airbags also kill people. We're talking about minor accidents. Let's say you are hitting a curb. 
and you would, without an airbag, you would have escaped this accident without any bodily injury, and the airbag kills you. There are about 80 deaths per year of airbags. You don't know about it, right? Because airbags save lives. So now it's a consent, concerted effort between regulators, insurance, and so forth. Because this, uh, this technology saves lives, the fact that it also kills people is, is somehow managed. That means, of course, people get compensation and so forth, but the pool of money for all this compensation is, is, is handled. This is why you don't hear about it. So I believe that if automated, and here is just a conjecture, if automated driving statistically is much, much better than human driving, these types of accidents that you can prove that the robotic system, it, it will be handled through insurance, through... Uh, because if, if for society this thing is a good thing, it will be resolved. So, so sort of a sort of a very specific thing in terms of the self-driving car. Um, is it uh, does, does the current system use object permanence? Like, if you see like a like a pedestrian walk behind an SUV, a parked SUV, does it anticipate the pedestrian walking out, coming out the other side? Currently not, but this is part of of, of, the, of the roadmap for into supporting uh, automated driving. And I didn't answer your second question there. Uh, the, the, these images of a policeman waving and so forth, no, currently the systems are not doing it, but I don't see a major hurdle in, in recognizing the action of, of a person. We, we, we are getting there. We are now recognizing the pose of the person. Is the person looking at us? Is the back turned to us? Is the, where is the person? Is it on the road, on the pavement? Uh, knowing whether the person is signaling or not is, is a natural growth of this kind of understanding what, what the person is, is doing. I don't think it's a major impediment. I think a, a, a bigger impediment to completely autonomous driving is junction negotiation. Taking a left turn in a junction, um, it's a problem because humans do not, they bend the rules, they don't follow the rules. When you are, when you, because if you follow the rules, you'll simply get stuck there. No, no, nobody will let you. Right? But now imagine a robotic system, a robotic system bending the rules. It's, it's, so I think that, that is the more bigger thing to think about, about negotiating uh, junctions. But you know, a policeman uh, waving his hand and so forth, this is not a big, not, not a big problem. Uh, you mentioned that an OrCam can learn. Have, yes. uh, have any of your beta testers found that capability just useful? OK, so I need, I need, to, I need to qualify what it means to, to, to learn. Uh, in terms of recognition, there are two types of recognition. There's class-based recognition, knowing that this is a money, uh, this is a, a bus or this is a traffic light. It's a class of objects. And there is instance-based recognition, doing simply a texture matching. For example, knowing that this is a 100 note, you recognize this not as a class. You have a picture of a 100 note in your database, and you do image-to-image uh, -image matching. Of course, you don't do the raw image-to-image -image matching. There's a certain representation of the image, and you match the representations. This is what I mean by learning. Say, for example, I want to, the system to recognize this object, not by reading, but by looking at the entire texture and recognizing that this is an Expo whiteboard care product. So what, what, what I would do, I would take this and wave it to the camera. So waving would be uh, signaling to the camera. It's a learning phase. So what this waving process would do, would, uh, the camera would put a bounding box around the object using motion. And then it will uh, ask me what it is. I would say whatever I say. It will record my, my voice uh, snippet. It will take an image representation, add it to the library. And then it will be part of the objects that it recognizes. Next time I hold it and I point on it, it will not start reading the text. It will find a match to the library and repeat what I said when I taught the system uh, the object. This is what I said by teaching the object. The same thing with faces. You can teach the system a new face by pointing at the face. The system continuously does face detection. When it detects a finger combined with a face, it understands that you want to teach it and tells, asks you what is the name of the person. And it will not store the image. It will store a presentation of the image into a database of faces. And then any time the system detects a face, it will match the representation of the face to the database. If it detects it, if it finds a match, it will say the name. If it doesn't find the match, it will say nothing. Much better hardware, or is everybody else in computer vision using 
complex? Well, it's, it's a combination of both. Uh, Mobili is, it has a specialized chip, a system on, on chip. With this system on chip, so the challenge with hardware in, in, in automotive is three things. One, you need a lot of computing power to do computer vision. This goes without saying. Second, you need it to run in very, very low power consumption. So low power consumption is around 2.5 watts. Just to give you a scale of things, the core i7 that I have here on my MacBook Air is about 60 to 70 watts. Okay, we're talking about the order of magnitude uh, difference. So you want very high computing capability, very, very low power. Third, you want it to be very, very low cost. Very low cost means single digit in dollars. Okay, that's, so there are three contradictory you know, uh, requirements. So we designed a chip which, has, which satisfies these three requirements and its computing power is, is very, very uh, significant. So this is an, a very high utilization, utilization for computer, co computer vision. Second, the algorithms you, you, you design also needs to be tailored for real-time processing. So take, for example, convolutional nets. Let's look at the academic papers you find on convolutional nets. Let's look at AlexNet, you know, the 2012 Hinton uh, paper. It has 800, so it's an image net. It takes an image, 200 by 200 image, and gives you a label, category one of 1,000 uh, labels. It has 832 million multiply accumulates to run through it. So just to give you a scale, uh, it will take about six seconds on a Tegra X1 chip. It will take about more or less the same time on an IQ3 chip. So six seconds, one frame, right? And it has 60 million parameters. Let's take the deep face of, uh, of Facebook and, and the Wolf. Uh, it's a network that takes a, a 100 by 100 image of a face and does face recognition. Has 120 million parameters. And you know, hundreds of millions of multiply accumulate. So this is definitely cannot run in real time. We're talking about processes that run 30 frames per second and do things that are even more challenging than doing image to category. For example, this pixel labeling, this green carpet that, that, that I've shown. So it requires also designing your algorithms uh, differently. It, designing networks that are very, very efficient, leveraging the fact that we have much more data than anything that has been run in, in, in academic uh, research. Normally in academic research, the amount of data is not enough and you are in an overfit situation and you use regularization to, to control the, the, the sample uh, complexity. In Mobili, we're on the other way. We, we are never in an overfit. We have so much uh, data that it's a completely different uh, problem uh, to solve, and, and we design much, much more efficient uh, networks. So, for example, this network of the green carpet, the semantic uh, labeling, um, takes about 4% of the capacity of the IQ3 chip. The existing chip, it will be less than 1% of the IQ4 chip, and it's only a few millions of, of parameters, so it doesn't take much in terms of, uh, of memory. And memory is important. Uh, in automotive, the size of the flash is, is very, very limited. The maximum size of flash is 128 megabytes of automotive. And this is nothing. If you are talking about networks of 100 million parameters, you already filled the 100 megabyte of, of flash. So it's only a few minutes. So it's, it's a combination. Designing software that fits uh, real-time processing and designing hardware that has significant computing power at very low power consumption. How do you compare the architecture of the IQ chip to um, graphic process? So I had here, uh, let me see, I think I have here in one of the hidden slides. Let me go here, maybe, oh yeah, I have it here. So this slide shows Okay, so this is flexibility. Flexibility, the ultimate flexibility is a CPU. It's a branch and bound architecture, a risk architecture. You can run any code. So this is maximum flexibility, but has the performance is, is, is much lower than anything else. Because you have high flexibility, you're, you're paying price in terms of performance. A DSP is somewhere here. It has 
much higher performance, but flexibility is much, much lower. A, a GPU is somewhere in between. This is our core in the IQ3. So it has more performance for the same flexibility than, than, than a GPU. It's about three times the ratio in terms of performance and, and flexibility to, to, to a GPU. And uh, these are the, in the IQ4, there are these two additional ones. So you see this PMA has very, very low flexibility, but huge uh, performance. So this is for very, very specific types. So it's more like an ASIC, very, very, very specific. This MPC has a flexibility very, very similar to a CPU, but has eight times the performance. So now if you take all three of them, you're basically spanning the entire spectrum of flex flexibility versus performance. So the key here is utilization. Right? When you read about specs of chips, they all talk about gigaflops, teraflops, but they don't talk about utilization because utilization is algorithm dependent. It's not, it's not a fixed uh, a number. What we designed, designed cores that have a very high utilization for the type of algorithms we run in computer vision, which are different from the type of algorithms you run in signal processing in which DSP is designed for. And it's different from the type of algorithms like coding and coding, which a GPU is designed for in computer graphics. Computer vision has its own place in, in, in science, okay? It's not, it's not uh, signal processing, it's not computer graphics, it has, its own, it has its own place and therefore it deserves its own architecture. And this is how we get the huge performance and uh, power consumption capabilities. Okay, one last question. Can these systems, especially OCAM, reach back to any servers to augment the processing resources? No, none of these systems uh, have communication to, to a backbone or to, or to servers. Um, Orcam could have enjoyed something like this, but we, we noticed that you know, most of the users, since visual impairment is age-related, much of it is age-related, we're talking about people that are, you know, that, that are technology-averse, having odd communication to the cloud and to computers and so forth. It's nice for, for young people, but you know, most of, uh, of our customers would not make use of it. So with Orcam, it's all, it's all uh, local and it has to run in real time. If you start sending images to the cloud and coming back, it will not be in, 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 in real time. With Mobileye, <coughs> right now, there is no communication to the backbone except uh, Tesla. With Tesla, they, do, they can do upgrade over the air, which is only Tesla uh, does that. So once you have all the hardware in place, you can incrementally add software features, just like we do today with smartphones when, when, you, when we update the, the firmware. So for example, in October, Tesla launched the first mono camera with us that did only traffic sign recognition and lane departure warning. And within a within few months, they added more capabilities like ACC, like uh, autonomous electronic uh, braking and uh, high beam assist. And, and so they can add this over, over the air. But cars do not communicate with, with the backbone. But this is something that will definitely happen in the course of the next uh, 10 years, that cars will communicate with the backbone, send data to the backbone. Cars will communicate between cars. All of this is, is in the roadmap of the industry. Very good.